compressors are your friend, oh, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, someone uh, said to me once, it always sticks with me, compressors are tone lingerie. Because <laughs> no one knows you've got it on, yeah. but you feel sexier. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'd say that's about the truest thing I've heard all week. <laughs> Even if it's Monday. That's great. <laughs> Hi guys, how are you doing? It's me, Sam. So I'm joined today with my dear friend Russell Broom. How are you, sir? I'm doing really well. How are you? Very well. So this is kind of a new thing that we're going to be doing, uh, talking about our favourite guitar type things and uh, jamming some interesting stuff. Yeah. So uh, Russell is probably the hardest working session musician I know. Uh, why don't you tell everyone about, about what you do? Well, I've kind of had a weird uh, career because I started as a guitar player. Yeah. Uh, you know, and I was kind of a jazz geek when I was a kid. Right. So it was always about learning, you know, how to play through giant steps and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. And then I sort of fell more into the punk rockabilly side of things for a couple of years and then got into playing pop music with a, a singer named Jan Arden. Right. Uh, this was in the mid 90s. And you did a lot of touring with her? I did. I played with her for 15 years. Wow. So, you know, we played all over the world and played on The Tonight Show and all that kind of stuff. And, and, uh, and through that, I expanded from just being a guitar player to being a co-writer with her and then into engineering and producing records. Right. So I stopped touring about eight, nine years ago and I got more into the production side of it. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that's been really fun because as a guitar player, you know, once you become a record producer, you sort of see that instrument through a completely different lens. Yeah, different perspective. Yeah, and it really, uh, it really made me kind of improve my playing and focus on certain fundamental things that I, I might have bypassed over the years of just focusing on live playing. Right, yeah, yeah. And then uh, it also helped me work as a producer with bands, you know, in dealing with their guitar players and yeah. trying to get the best out of them because I understood what it was like to be on that side of the recording glass. So it's quite but, handy to have both hats. Oh yeah, that you can wear. Yeah, you know. and I think it's kind of the modern way the industry is going. You know, yeah. like a lot of times as a producer, I'll play a lot of guitar on the records, or I'll play bass, and I'll mix yeah. and engineer them as well. Whereas, you know, in the late '90s, early 2000s, you know, if I was producing a record, I'd just be producing it. Right. You know, and there'd be engineers and guys working Pro Tools and all that. Yeah. But now it's sort of become a little more intimate, which I think is is kind of a, a, a more fun way to do it. More control. 
Yeah. yeah, yeah, and it's less like being in the big doctor's office of a recording studio, right? Because it can be really intimidating, absolutely, you know, and feel really uncomfortable and kind of unnatural. If you can make it more like a living room kind of a thing, yeah, where everyone seems to be more comfortable, absolutely, yeah, and just pump enough liquor into them that they just stop crying. <laughs> that's the that's the key. Yeah, it works great. <laughs> yeah. guitar because that's such a amazing piece it's a neat one yeah it's got a neat history too so when I was working with Jan Arden we did a record called happy in uh, in California and there's a guy on it named Mark Goldenberg who's playing guitar who's one of my favorite guitar players ever mm -hmm. he spent years playing with Jackson Brown he's played with Rick Springfield stuff wow. like that but he's a tremendous player because he, he's extremely musical yeah and he studied a lot with a guy named Ted Green who's kind of one of the fathers of, of kind of guitar teaching Okay. He's just an incredible guitar player. Yeah. So we were on the session, and Mark had a 57 Fender Esquire. Right. And when I heard that guitar, I, I'd never heard a guitar that old in person. And I yeah. was like, my goodness, that's like, yeah. that's a great sound, right? Oh, yeah. And I was kind of a telly player before that, and I had a, a couple sort of American or Japanese Fenders. And I heard this guitar, and I went on the hunt. Right. So about three years later, I walked into a guitar store in Calgary, and... Um, I saw a guy selling this guitar to the guy who owned the store. He came okay. in and he was, yeah. and I saw it and I told the owner, I need to buy that guitar. And he said, yeah. no, it's not for sale. Oh. So I bugged him for two years. <laughs> two years? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And eventually I ran into him. It was weird. The store was actually closed, but his door was wide open and I'd forgotten the store was closed on that day. Yeah. So I walked in um, and waited till he got back because the lights were off and I thought if I can just walk in, someone's going to walk in and rip off his store. Yeah. So. Thankfully enough, he came in about 15, 20 minutes, came wandering in and said, well, what are you doing here? And I said, well, your door was open. Yeah. I didn't want you to get ripped off. Saved his ass. Yeah. And he goes, well, I sold the store and I'm moving. Did you still want that old Telecaster? And I was like, yeah, I do. <laughs> so he pulled it out of the case and, you know, it was in pieces. He'd taken it apart. And it's a 1957 Fender Esquire. Nice. That's had the world's worst sort of refinishing job, if you can call that. I think it's house paint. You know, he, really? yeah, he painted over the string oh, things. Yeah, yeah. I think they sanded it before they painted it too, because maybe yeah. the edges were too sharp. <laughs> you know, like everything you don't want to have happen to a vintage guitar. I have the original pickup, but it doesn't work. It squeals. Mm -hmm. So I put a Lindy Fralin in it. And Esquires were always routed for a neck pickup, but they yeah. wouldn't put the neck pickups in. Oh. 
So when I got it, it had a neck pickup in it and a different pick guard. So I know this is a 60s style pick guard, but... It starts to have that versatility. Yeah, the second pick totally. Yeah. And, you know, it's one of those things where it is a power tool. Yeah. So oh, I yeah. throw it in a gig bag, I take it to gigs, and I, I'm not super precious You've about it. You've got to use it. Yeah. I, I, I mean, pieces like that should be enjoyed by, by everyone. I agree. And not just under a bed. Right, you totally. Know? I think there's something that amazing about how it makes you feel just holding a guitar like that. With the kind of history it has, one, yeah. One of my buddies brought in a 56 Strat. Uh -huh. I got to play it a couple months ago. Wow. I just felt like a child at Christmas holding mm. this incredible instrument. Well, I find the older ones, because they've had music played through them for 50 years, the, you know, the cells and the wood cells kind of dry out differently, yeah. oh, with different yeah. resonances. Yeah, yeah. So the tones kind of get a little more focused. Where I find with new guitars where maybe the wood isn't quite old enough to be a guitar yet, yeah. but you're dry enough, yeah. that maybe they sound kind of pillowy or they don't have this real focused sort of tone. There's something about a way, uh, the way that uh, dry wood resonates. Absolutely. You know, yeah. there's, uh, there's, there's definitely a very uh, truthful thing about old guitars sounding better. Yeah. I guess it must be the same with violins. Yeah. You look at like a Stradivarius. Right. The way that wood has matured. Right. I guess it's like, like a fine scotch or something. <laughs> <laughs> there's an unfine scotch? Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, in this guitar, it just... It has just a really nice focused quality about it. It's just, yeah. it's, it has a sound, so... I'll, I I'll get a few close-ups and put them, <laughs> put them over so everyone For sure. can see. But you know, I tend to, because I do a lot of session work, yeah. I tend to gravitate towards instruments that have a maybe a particular characteristic sound yeah. about them, yeah. rather than something that just sounds good or yeah. nice. Yeah. Stuff that maybe sounds a bit nasal or a bit harsh tends to work better for me. Yeah. Because I'm always layering tones or trying to find a guitar part or a guitar sound that'll fit in between the drums and the vocals and the keyboards and the yeah. bass and all that stuff. Yeah, yeah. So it's kind of a different set of rules for when I'm, I'm working a lot than just trying to get a really nice guitar tone, you know, when you're at home alone and you've got a couple amps set up. And, yeah, you know, all those really nice kind of guitar tones, they never work when I'm at work. You need something that will sit in the mix nice. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, yeah and, and uh, sometimes guitars that have a bit more focused sort of frequency point on them, they hit the amps differently, yeah. right? And yeah. then you sort of have this really interesting tone that may not sound great on its own, but in the context of a song, usually oh, sounds really yeah. great. Absolutely. Let's get the neck pick up a little bit. Yeah, yeah, it's quite... It's, it's fairly bright, you know, it's not a Strat pickup for no. sure. But. but it's nice for, you know, that sort of... That yeah. pretty kind of oh, stuff. Yeah. And uh, for chunkier kind of rhythm things, it works really well. quite as throaty as a Strat pickup, mm -hmm. but it can be a little bit, it's a little more anemic, I think, sounding than a Strat pickup, but it has a place, you know. Yes, it's neat.